statement. Yeah, that should be should be recording now. Perfect. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this first uh, kind of viticulture seminar series today. Um, today we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Akif Escalon. So Akif got his master's and PhD in plant pathology uh, from Turkey before coming to the US for uh, his postdoctoral studies at UC Davis with the late Dr. Gubler. Uh, he then went on to be a plant pathologist and a cooperative extension specialist at UC Riverside in Southern California. And then in 2018, he came back to UC Davis um, uh, where he is now a plant pathologist and cooperative extension specialist. Uh, where he's leading a laboratory focusing on uh, the control of fungal diseases of grapevines, uh, as well as small fruits, as well as berries. So thank you, Akif. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for the introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to uh, give uh, this talk to the Colorado grape growers. Uh, I, have been, I have been in Colorado. Uh, I didn't have a chance to meet with the grape growers, but uh, we had a meeting on the campus a couple of years ago. So you guys are living a beautiful state, beautiful uh, place, I believe. Uh, you are growing um, uh, very good, nice uh, grape and making the good wine out of those grapes. Anyway, um, uh, so now today I, I'm going to talk to you about the powdery mildew, uh, including identification, uh, biology, epidemiology, and uh, control in vineyards. Uh, my understanding from Rob that uh, this uh, the powdery mildew is a, not a big, big, big issue like the issue that we have in California, which has the, the big disease pressure that we have. <clears throat> But so you were able to manage it. So what I'm going to do today is that I'm going to give you a, a how to identify what is the biology to, to understand better uh, and then talk about a little bit epidemiology, which is the most important um, uh, part of the disease uh, triangle that I'm going to talk about it and uh, give you an, um, the options of uh, controlling in uh, vineyards. Maybe after this talk, uh, you will be able to have um, uh, a few other options in your pocket uh, to control the powdery mildew uh, disease um, in your vineyard. So a little bit of uh, background information uh, for you. Um, the, the, the Latin or scientific name of the powdery mildew is Arecife nicator, uh, which uh, used to be known as Uncinilla nicator. Um, uh, as you may know that the, because of the, uh, the molecular identification technique recent years, uh, we have been reclassifying the diseases and then the, those uh, scientific names are um, uh, always changing it. Uh, so powdery mildew is an uh, obligate parasite, uh, which is uh, specific to white species. This specific species doesn't cause disease on uh, any other species, but white species. So interestingly, um, it is native to North America. Uh, it was first uh, identified in 1834 uh, in North America as a, as a, as a disease. Later on, uh, disease was um, introduced to Europe and um, the grape powdery mildew was observed throughout the grape growing regions, rest of the world, including California in 1859, and also Australia in 1866. So um, uh, this is the very, the very common since um, uh, the, the disease is worldwide uh, spread. It is a problem in uh, many grape growing areas in uh, the world. So in here a little bit, I'll talk to you about the asexual uh, life cycle. So this is the cartoonized, um, the pictures of it to, to, for you to visualize how the disease occurs. So this, uh, the, the green box is the, the leaf, uh, I assume. And um, so this orange uh, is the, the spurs of the, uh, or conidia of the powdery mildew. So powdery mildew conidia actually has its own 
a water bubble uh, within the uh, within the the, the the spores. Therefore, for the initial uh, germination, they don't require water, uh, access to free water. But the free water is is also uh, the flourish them to the grow. Anyway, so as soon as they land on the leaf and then they find their host and the right condition. So conidium just germinate as you can see in this uh, picture and then produce a, a germ tube. So uh, that also starts swelling, uh, which is also known as the aprasorium, which is a differentiation of the, of the, uh, the, the, the uh, structure or the, uh, the germination tube. Later on, that aprosorium uh, penetrates forcefully in the, in the leaves, and then uh, that's called the hostorium, which produce a secondary metabolite and also take the nutrition and water. So that nutritional water makes the, the conidia produce more mycelium on the surface. It's very interestingly, so powdery mildew produce the the, the hostorium within the plant, but most of the body or structure is uh, on the surface of the, of the leaves. Within a few days from one support to the several or uh, the sometime um, the hundreds of supports of the conidio production occurs uh, if you do not control uh, powdery mildew on the, on the things. It's, it's very, very interesting um, uh, lifestyle that they have. So these are the, the very first symptom of the powdery mildew. Actually, the initial symptom that you could see is the, like the, so on the leaf surface, it's a little bit yellowish structure. Sometimes you may not be able to see the, uh, the powdery white uh, structure. So by the time you see that this kind of powdery mildew on the leaves, it's kind of like the too late. Uh, so uh, we usually start uh, application of the fungicide uh, before uh, the, this kind of uh, stage, uh, when we first start having the initial infection, which I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, we monitor based on the, uh, the, the index uh, the, that we are gonna talk about. Too. So these are the, like the on the on the, the picture on the light right is the is the heavily infested leaves uh, again uh, this is the very late stage so you don't want to be waiting uh, this stage of the coverage of the the leaves uh, with the powdery mildew uh, to start controlling it. So powdery mildew uh, doesn't only show up on the leaves but also on the stem. Uh, so these uh, dark brown structures are caused by the colonization of the powdery mildew. So the one on the right is the is a little bit late stage of the, uh, the powdery mildew on, on green shoots. Uh, Sometimes they stay under those green shoots and then when the shoots um, uh, become uh, like the cane, um, the hardened uh, on, the, on the plant, you can still uh, see these kind of uh, blackish uh, structure on, on the plant. So here we go. Uh, so these are the real, real symptoms on the, on the, uh, the fruit uh, that it, sometimes it starts from uh, one berry or, or multiple berries, as you can see, is totally the powder. Again, uh, this is the, like the late stage uh, that you don't wanna be waiting uh, until this stage uh, for controlling. Uh, just for you that, in California condition, the, the wine grow, winemakers uh, are uh, tolerating up to two percent, sometimes five percent of the of the the, the cluster uh, with the powdery mildew. Um, the latest one is the two percent. So again, uh, so you don't want to be having uh, these kind of uh, powdery mildew on your cluster. Uh, when you are selling your uh, grape to the winemakers. Here's another, uh, the close-up picture. Again, uh, you can see the old the conidia. And then from this point on, um, the, the powdery mildew is continuously spreading their spores in the vineyard, looking for uh, new uh, tissues, leaves, fruit, and then colonize it. So, 
Here's the late stage of the now the powdery mildew on the on the grapes. Uh, again, this is like the fully uh, covered. So one of the the thing that I want to show you is that the the one of the late stage symptom is the um, the berry cracking, as you can see. So the main reason that the berry cracking is that the when the powdery mildew colonized and then killed the other uh, skin of the berry, of course the plant is continuous sending the carbohydrate into the berry. So the, because of the disease, berry skin is losing its flexibility. When the sugar continue coming into it, it cannot expand, it just cracks. So this is the beginning of the, that kind of stage. So this is the worst case scenario. Uh, you don't wanna be having this kind. So the problem with the, with the powdery mildew is that the, Let's say you have a heavy, um, the, the burden of the, uh, the disease pressure one year. And then if that year, if you don't control it, you lose the, your, your crop. Um, but when you start controlling it next year, uh, you may um, uh, control and then get the good crop. But the, most importantly, you don't want to be having initial uh, high pressure uh, from the beginning. Therefore, if you have a high pressure of the disease last year, that will affect uh, your next year pressure because of the, 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 the source of the inoculum or conidia uh, is going to be high uh, pressure. So this kind of problem is not going to be on your problem, but also it's going to be affecting your neighbor uh, or the, someone who hasn't been uh, uh, having the powdery mildew that will also affect. So anyway, uh, the controlling the powdery mildew is a is a, a collaborative effect. So um, the, the the if you are having the high disease pressure, you all have to uh, try to control uh, powdery mildew in your vineyard. So when we look at the sexual life, like the fungal diseases, most of them has a asexual and then sexual uh, life stage. Uh, so those are important for us because uh, they will also affect the overwintering structure. How much of the disease will kind of go through the, win the, the winter and then how much of it's gonna be the, like the coming out in the spring that you have to deal uh, as a as an owner, so these are the uh, cosmotesia of the of the disease or, or or pathogen, which is the sexual um, reproduction um, the structure. As you can see, you can select the things. So when you look at the at the, the the close up the structure, it's like the uh, this kind of like the dot, it's the black. So these are the um, the, the very characteristic appendages. Uh, on powdery mildew, uh, on, on uh, Unsunila necator, uh, the appendages is the curl at the, at the end, which is the, um, the one of the uh, morphological identification um, uh, way that you can identify. So each um, as the structure has more than one assay. That's the name of the this structure. And we have uh, more than um, the, about eight ascospore, uh, which is the, the, the one spore kind of seed uh, that will also uh, start uh, causing disease when they arrive uh, on the tissues, which we talk about it. So I just want to go through in this uh, slide is that the, uh, the disease cycle that will um, uh, give you a better understanding uh, about the disease cycle. So as a plant pathologist, it's very important for us to know the disease cycle because uh, this is going to help us understand and then when to start um, uh, the controlling or application of the fungicide if we have to uh, to control the, these uh, diseases. So primary inoculum of the, <clears throat> uh, the powdery mildew is the cosmotesia, which is uh, the sexual overwintering structure that resides on the leftover leaves or, uh, or the belly berries. Some of them uh, could be dropped off on the, on the ground. They can, they can stay uh, as a cosmotesia stage on the, on the plant. So those cosmotesia could be activated uh, with rain, fog, or dew, anything like that. So they just start releasing and spreading their spores in the air. 
It is also known that the, the, some, the another initial uh, infection source is the hyphal infection in the butt, um, uh, which is a very low percentage of the of the infection source. Majority or most, I would say, more than eighty percent of the infection. Uh, is uh, started from the uh, cosmothesia, which is uh, very important to, to not have uh, too much disease year before if you want to have less disease pressure for the next year. So when the initial infection happens, uh, as I show you uh, my uh, uh, initial uh, cartoon uh, life cycle, they start producing the spores, which can be thousands of the colonial spores within a, a few days. Uh, so that would also disseminate, which is the majority of the dissemination in the vineyard or within the canopy is gonna be a dissemination of the colonial spores. Those conodia spores turn into the, um, the cosmothesia, which is the overwintering structures and then, and then goes back to this uh, life uh, cycle uh, back. Uh, so uh, this is like the, the, the how the disease progress. So this is the picture that I wanted to show you that also showing um, as a study that was done by uh, Dr. Gubler um, in 2005, uh, that uh, the, these are the pictures of the, of the initial butt, dormant butt that shows the, the powdery mildew could survive as a conidia or also uh, mycelium within the, uh, the butt. Again, as I mentioned uh, you that the, the, the percentage of the disease initial infection is, is um, a very low. Majority of the infection comes from the uh, cosmothesia. So what makes a bad disease year? I don't know if you have heard about the disease triangle. So this is the tree disease triangle that uh, uh, the, the, in the plant pathology discipline, uh, we learn and we teach to our students, which is telling us is that the, in order to have a good disease, you have to have a host, which should be a susceptible and vulnerable and ready to, be, to have the disease. You have to have the pathogen present and healthy enough that they can do the initial infection and then cause disease. And also you have to have the right environmental conditions based on the pathogen. That could be temperature, that could be moisture or, or weather conditions or, or all kinds of environmental conditions. So in order to have disease, all this has to be present and perfect condition. It's very interesting that Sometimes in my classes, I teach my students that the, sometimes it's not easy to have disease. So there are a lot of conditions has to come up with in the right uh, condition that you can have the disease. So when we go through the, uh, the, the, this disease triangle, uh, most of the grape cultivars are, are susceptible to powdery mildew. Some of them are high susceptible, some of them are low susceptibility. And pathogen is able to, Everywhere um, uh, um, uh, in the in the grape growing areas present, and then they will cause a problem. And then for me, the most important part is the environmental condition when it comes to the bad or good disease for the powdery mildew, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about. I don't know if you have heard about the powdery mildew disease index, um, which is a uh, a kind of like the, the index that would give us an idea uh, how much uh, or how bad the disease is gonna be because of, uh, based on the right environmental condition. And uh, so because of that, uh, so you can make decision whether you would like to start at, at, at the fungicide uh, application or uh, how often uh, do you have to do the fungicide application in your vineyard? So in California, uh, this is the, the, the index that has been um, uh, discovered and then identified by 
uh, late Dr. Guplur, my predecessor uh, in this um, uh, job. Uh, he was also my mentor when I was postdoc uh, at UC Davis a long time ago. So, uh, so the disease index is the, it's like the index ranges from one to 100, which is a concept. Requires three consecutive days with the six hours of the between 70 and 82 Fahrenheit, which is the right condition temperature for disease to show up, that's the timing. So uh, basically uh, this disease um, index increased 20 point or 10 point less 20 points pass because of the, uh, when the right conditions that you have uh, uh, at that growing season uh, in your vineyard. So therefore, um, uh, if your vineyard is in, the, in, in a microclimate area, if these condition, temperature and humidity is, is different than other places, so you may have low or, or high disease pressure in your vineyard. So it's very important to know uh, what these temperatures are in your vineyard. Anyway, uh, so now the, uh, the index goes between six to 100, which means the, the, the pathogen is um, the recovering every five days, which means that everything is right condition uh, for pathogen to multiply uh, within uh, for the five days. So this is the graph version of the, uh, the, the, the mildew index in California. Uh, UC ANR, ANR are, uh, is, is um, responsible uh, doing on certain microclimate in California. This is the free uh, surface for, uh, service for uh, California grape growers. Um, uh, so you can adapt it or, or uh, you, maybe your university can help you setting up this, this um, uh, index. Basically, so this is the, the, the timing uh, from the growing season starting from uh, March uh, to the end of the July. So these are the, uh, the, the, the index. When the index is below the, this blue line, that means you have a low uh, risk of the, um, the powdery mildew, sometimes you may not need the spray, uh, so that way you can save some money. And if the index is uh, between 30 to 50, that means a normal ap application of the interval, you have to spray, apply, that means you have a high risk of the, of the, the powdery mildew. If the index is uh, more than uh, 60, which is uh, in these months, so you have to increase your intervals and then be top of the, your spray program. Uh, within, the, uh, within the, after in this case, this year, uh, after June, you can reduce back because index is getting uh, lower. Anyway, so this index is, is a very useful for uh, grape growers to make decision uh, whether they need the spray, uh, the, the, the pesticide, to control it or how often uh, uh, they need to spray uh, the, the, this pesticide. So you can have uh, access to in California condition uh, in this uh, link if you like. Uh, again, um, if you like to have something like that, the one that we have in California will not help you because your conditions are, are different than the California. So you have to have your own uh, the mildew index that will tell you how, what is the risk level of the index. So um, in uh, Colorado grape growers like condition, if the powdery mildew uh, pressure is not high, uh, you may be um, get away with this problem with just the cultural controls, which uh, just the reducing the relative humidity that will increase the airflow or increase the sunlight penetration, which um, um, the, the powdery mildew is very sensitive to the UV light. Um, uh, during the day, uh, they are getting damaged, especially when you have the light getting into the canopy uh, that will uh, affect the powdery mildew um, in a high percentage. All these reduction of the relative humidity, increasing airflow or increasing the sunlight penetration could be done just the leaf removal. Uh, in California, which is um, a very common practice uh, in, in um, a certain period uh, in the uh, life stage uh, or in the season. So we remove the uh, extra uh, leaf 
around the fruit to have the, uh, the induced airflow uh, that would also help us reducing the uh, sometime um, the, the, the fungicide spray 50%, um, that would help a lot that. So anyway, uh, so these are uh, cultural options uh, if you would like to go uh, with that. So um, I just want to talk to you about the, like the sulfur um, application, uh, which is uh, one of the good products. Um, if you would like to utilize, I'm sure uh, some of you have already know, and then you have been using it. If you are a grape grower, I'm sure you know about the sulfur, um, uh, which is one of the um, main uh, product. So lime sulfur is, is the one uh, that could be applied during dormant season uh, to um, uh, get a control of the, some of those uh, cosmothesia fruiting bodies. Uh, in the past, uh, Dr. Gubler has done some uh, experiments and then he showed that the lime sulfur helps uh, to reduce uh, those uh, cosmothesia. Anyway, if you think that you have a high disease pressure year before, uh, if you are concerned about the, those uh, cosmothesia during the dormant season, so lime sulfur application is, is an option. But uh, there are a lot of disadvantages of the lime sulfur that put, um, you cannot apply the lime sulfur on the green shoots, by the way, just to, to make sure that that can burn uh, your plants. Uh, it's the dormant application uh, option only. Uh, again, uh, lime sulfur could harm or make a lot of rust on your equipment. Um, you have to have the all kinds of like the uh, safety issues. It's a little bit um, um, the complicated. To, to use, but it's an option. So dusting sulfur is is very good option in early season. Um, uh, in California growers, especially um, uh, when you have a vineyard in the in the slope uh, or or the, the ground is if the ground is too wet to drive the tractor, uh, dusting with helicopter or uh, or other uh, vehicle is very common practice in California and um, uh, depend on the risk index, of course. Um, so that's an, an option uh, if you would like to go with it. So wettable uh, sulfur that could be either micronized and dry flowable, uh, both of them are, are good options. The, the only, uh, the, 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 these are the lime sulfur, or sorry, uh, sulfur general is a natural product, which is inexpensive and effective. Um, in many cases, more than a pesticide or fungicide. And as has been used for hundreds of the years, and no case of the resistance because of the mode of action of the, of the sulfur. So when we look at the mode of action of the sulfur, the, the sulfur controls the powdery mildew or disease by either residual action, which is contact effect or secondary effect, or volatilization, which is the, um, the, 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 with the temperature increase, it just volatiles and uh, the, the decreased oxygen level uh, within the cells and then control it. So the, the, because of the uh, double uh, uh, effective uh, mode of action, it is uh, difficult for a pathogen to produce resistance against the, uh, the sulfur. The reason that I'm saying the, the, the resistance in um, uh, Western uh, grape growing areas in uh, including California, uh, Oregon and Washington, uh, we have uh, the resistant uh, isolate of the powdery mildew against the strawberry uh, group of the fungicide. Uh, I don't know if it is the case in uh, Colorado, but not, right now we are having that problem because of that. It's very important uh, to, 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 to way of controlling the powdery mildew in vineyards. So the disadvantages of the, the sulfur is that the, it can be washed off easily with the rain. You have to apply it after the rain if you are having a lot of rain. Uh, it could be less effective in the cool weather because as I mentioned you, in order for um, uh, the sulfur to activate it and then volatilize, it needs a little bit warmer temperature, but not too hot. So it may burn uh, uh, wines when the hot weather, when the temperature is uh, more than 90, 92. So that's the high risk of the burning 
of the leaves, as you can see in these pictures. So um, uh, those are the advantages and then the disadvantages of the surface. So tell, uh, your call, uh, what you would like to do. So only well, another disadvantage of the sulfur that I have to um, address uh, in this presentation is that the, so many of the wine growers um, um, don't like to have a uh, sulfur application um, after the fruit set or verizon or certain stage because uh, they uh, think that the, uh, the sulfur uh, affected their wine quality, even though uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, scientific studies that show that that's not the case. Uh, but that's also uh, an, an issue um, uh, uh, if you would like to uh, apply the sulfur uh, to control the, um, the, the powder milieu in your vineyard. So again, uh, as I mentioned you that the, 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 this is the guidelines for reducing the resistance risk against the, uh, the pathogen. So you have to limit the number of the application of the strobulurin, uh, which is the, the FRAC group 11 fungicide. And uh, so there's the resistance issue on that one. So uh, limit the number of the consecutive application of the, the these strobulurin group of fungicide, if possible, um, uh, either alternate or um, um, uh, the use with the other um, the the fungicide reduction of the of the mixing of the uh, the strawberry group the group the fungicide is very very important as from the standpoint of the fungicide resistance so sometime uh, you may want to use uh, this group of the fungicide in early uh, stage of the of the powdery mildew to knock it down and then after that uh, you can switch into the some of those organic or biological um, the fungicide that may have a little bit less uh, knockdown or effectiveness anyway i just want to show you that uh, it's, it's very important to either uh, alternate or to use different frag group which can be uh, found on any label uh, here's the the mode of action frag group number one and then uh, this could be the difference. So that will give you um, uh, that more information. So in my lab, uh, the, uh, we have been uh, doing the field fungicide efficacy trials. Uh, this is the trial that has been done for Dr. Gubler for many, many years. Uh, I have been doing in my lab for last three years. Uh, we just uh, did this one. So what we do is that uh, we kind of like to play the middleman uh, kind of situation um, uh, as a University of California. Um, so many of the uh, fungicide companies or chemical companies develop and come up with the, uh, the, their uh, product. Um, um, they would like us to do a trial uh, in a fair trial in the vineyard to see if they are working. So we do the set up the, uh, these experiment every year, apply um, their fungicide or the, the with their label rate. At the end, uh, we evaluate them and then give them those uh, results. Uh, so we, at the end of the, this trial, we invite both um, the growers, advisors, farm advisors, uh, as well as the company representatives to show them the, uh, our uh, results. So that will give a, an idea for the uh, company representatives to see how how good their product is performing uh, that also give us our uh, growers an idea which product to to uh, seek for um, for their uh, the trial so um to, this is just to show you uh, give you an idea how we do it actually this is uh, rob uh, uh, he, when he was a graduate student in my lab uh, so he was is responsible uh, of the, this uh, uh, field trial, and then he did a, an awesome job, and then um, the, gave us um, um, uh, very good results uh, from these trials. This, this is how we do it. So at the end of the, the season, uh, we just um, evaluate the, uh, the, 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 these uh, diseases based on the criteria that has been developed, and then uh, produce uh, a report. Uh, based on the, those reports, we just uh, have an idea which uh, fungicide is working uh, better or not. So uh, of course, uh, 
uh, uh, we also uh, monitor the, 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 the environmental condition, including rain and relative humidity and temperature. So that also helped us a better understanding uh, how the trial went that year. Uh, we also follow up our um, uh, the risk index based on the these risk index. Um, we can also modify our, our application of the dose fungicide. And then at the end, we get this. So this is the part of the, the trial, just to give you an idea about the, um, uh, what chemical uh, uh, the, the fungicide work better in what rate. And also, as you can see, some of the fungicide uh, are going as a program because we would like to avoid not using single fungicide over and over uh, to reduce the uh, chance of the um, fungicide um, resistance. So most of them is coming as a program. So at the end, um, uh, so these are the lists that has been published in my lab website. So um, growers or uh, pest control advisors uh, are, are uh, able to access to these results for over years and then uh, get an idea what kind of program uh, that that year uh, that they would like to uh, follow up. So these results, if you are interested in, um, uh, the, the, this, this is my lab website that could be found in the fruit crop fungicide efficacy trials, not only powdery mildew, uh, but also we have uh, been doing the field fungicide trial on the pear scab, um, um, uh, botrytis as well. So you can find uh, those information as well if you wish. So with it, uh, all these trials are being uh, done with my lab members. This is not the full crew. It's the, the, the picture that was taken two years ago. Um, um, actually, Rob is right here. You will recognize him. So uh, they are the one who has done the, the most of the work and I get the credit somehow. So which, uh, I am very lucky to have a a very good team uh, in my laboratory. So with that, uh, I would like to have your um, question if you have uh, or comments or anything, uh, concerns. Um, I would like to make this one like a kind of um, interactive discussion so we can uh, go through everything. Excellent, thank you, Keith. I have a few questions, but yeah, before that we'll see if uh... Anybody else has some questions or concerns from that presentation? So I have uh, one question, Akif. So, uh, and it's kind of about um, the need for doing a post-harvest um, powdery mildew spray. So as I understand, if the uh, mildew persists kind of long enough or in big enough quantities, that it can kind of cause premature leaf drop, which means that um, some carbohydrates will not accumulate in sufficient numbers, which, uh, as I understand, can compromise kind of um, the cold hardiness of canes. So here in Colorado, obviously, that's a huge issue um, with uh, with cold damage. So what would you kind of recommend perhaps um, to growers that do have kind of persisting powdery mildew, whether it's on the canes, like you mentioned, um, in terms of what spray they could do or kind of what quantity or how many times that might need to happen? I don't know uh, if a powdery mildew residue would affect the cord hardness uh, that directly. Um, um, but if you are concerned about the cosmotesia, which is the overwintering structure, uh, you may try the lime sulfur in the dormant uh, season. That will be the, the one. But the, for the for cold hardness, it's totally temperature wise. Um, uh, last year, uh, I can give you an example of it uh, in California. Uh, November is our uh, going into the dormant season. Our grapes are not the um, completely dormant. Uh, we have a very unusual uh, cold weather in November that caused the, uh, the, the dead butt uh, on grapevine. And then um, most of the grape growers are having either a standard shoot or not the bud come out. So this has been, hasn't been happening for a long time in California. So we all were come up with the surprise and everything. So that's, that's the, the one of the, one of the, it's totally like the temperature wise. So um, 
again, um, in, in some part of the California, which is in the southern part of the California, we don't have enough um, uh, the cold temperature, Coachella Valley, for example, or Temecula Valley. Uh, uh, there, uh, farmers, growers are doing the overhead sprinkler uh, irrigation to increase the cold uh, to get the grapevine into dormant season uh, quicken. Um, uh, but uh, that also brings a lot of uh, the consequences and then side effect, and then that's not recommended. I don't think that could be applied in Colorado condition, which is you have a, a colder weather and climate, uh, that could be the, 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 the one, yeah. Yeah. And then do you, do you happen to know um, if kind of the Chasmotisia that overwinters, does it have a kind of a, a maximum temperature which it can withstand? So I think last winter we had, or last October, we had some negative 20 temperatures across a lot of the state. Do you know if that just these severe cold temperatures are enough to kind of uh, kill those overwintering structures? So it's kind of, that's why we might have less in the following year than a, for a cold winter. Actually, that's a very good question. <clears throat> I don't think so, because uh, these are known as overwintering structure. Uh, so they are uh, good for the coldest and hardness. If you think about uh, where the grapevine is native to, which is Mediterranean uh, climate, where the uh, also not only Mediterranean climate, uh, during the winter, it can get the cold hardness. So, um, uh, think about like the California condition as well. Um, um, the, so I don't think that's the case and low temperature will not affect or kill the dose cosmotesia uh, that much. They are gonna find a way uh, to survive um, because they are protected in those uh, structures very well. So we have a question from Julianne here. Um, so she said they had a, um, yeah, they lost a lot of their crop last year due to freeze, uh, had to cut down trunks and regrow shoots from the ground. Uh, we were not able to spray as we would normally. We are retraining uh, now with new growth, uh, seeing some powdery mildew. What would your recommendation to spray before winter? Yeah, so I don't have any experience uh, with, with the before the winter um, application. Um, I'm not going to be able to um, give you the guidance on that one, uh, which is very specific. I haven't done any experiment. So, um, but again, um, it's very difficult. I understand that down the trunks with the growth is, is, is very difficult. Uh, I haven't done any experiment on that one. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to give you guidance on that. No problem. Uh, thank you, Julian, for the question. I'll make a note of that and see if we can um, get an answer to you at some point. My recommendation would be to do absolutely nothing, as always. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but excellent talk. Um, we looked at Goupla model many, many, many years ago, for many, many years. And for us, it's absolutely useless. It has no value whatsoever in, in Colorado. And it, and it all relates to the fact that you know, we, we, if we start the Goopla model within three or four days, we have a high risk index because we are always in that absolute perfect temperature range as soon as our, as soon as our growing season starts. Sure. The problem is, or not the problem, the really, really good thing for us is rain is something we really don't know what it is. I mean, we had a couple of days yesterday and today, but, you know, we don't get much rainfall. So we often do not see powder mildew, sometimes not until August. It's just, we do not get that primary infection. And therefore the model itself is completely meaningless when there is no powder mildew out there. Um, here at our research center, the most I have ever sprayed in the last 16, 17 years is two. Many years, I don't spray at all. And I grow almost 50 different cultivars, some of them highly susceptible to powder mildew. So when it's a very, have... very different situation compared to California. I totally and, understand. And, and, and I wanna I wanna support your point you made. The the chesmoticia are overwintering structures. And think about it, it's an it's a, a, a disease that wasn't that didn't come from European grapes in the Mediterranean, it was it came from North America. 
It's, exactly. it's prevalent in New York, Vermont, Wisconsin, Minnesota, where we have temperatures that are way past, you know, way, way lower, negative 40, and they still have powdery mildew. So it, it's very well adapted in the overwintering stage to very, very, very cold temperatures. So that, that's not going to reduce the number uh, in, in our comparatively mild conditions, you know, compared to Minnesota, Wisconsin, you know, much more severe than California. But one one thing that thank you very much for for, for your um, uh, addition. That's that's perfect. That I didn't know some of those cases in Colorado grape, even though Rob told me uh, some of those um, the, the unique climate that you have in Colorado. Um, that it's it's very important. So uh, when you you say that the, you you didn't even you don't even spray until the August or you haven't seen the the powdery mildew so when you start seeing the powdery mildew how do you decide when to apply or how long to apply what what is your do you just go with the like based on the um the, the observation and the disease so the the approach we are taking we are using a post-infection trigger if we don't see it we don't spray when, when i first came here back in 2020 the average industry spray was six sprays following California guidelines, start shortly after bud break, keep cover, sulfur sprays, you know, DMIs, you know, strobes came much later. And, and I didn't see a reason for it. So we had a five-year project where we actually had scouts going out to various vineyards and trying to find powder mildew. And as I said, some years we didn't find until July. And, and so what's the point in spraying? We had sometimes had these infections event. You didn't go into the detail of the Gubler model of when an infection can occur, like the 50 Fahrenheit, eight hour leaf wetness, et cetera. Anyway, we talk to our industry a lot about that. And sometimes we still don't see the infection because while we might have, you know, rain at the right time, the temperatures right, often we also drop at night still well below 50. And then you need much longer time at cooler temperature. So our approach now is basically a post-infection spray program where if we do see it, and it's, say it's on, on Verdejo or on Chardonnay, which are highly susceptible, we will go in and hit it and prefer with at least two or three different fungicide frag groups. So I might combine a DMI with something else. I might throw in a Kelly Green um, and that's it. And then we just back off. The other thing to remember in July, it's 95 to 105 degrees over here. And yeah. UV radiation in our mountains is 20% higher than at your lab. And you, you pointed out the importance of UV and high light and high temperature on the destruction of the mycelium. So while we have the haustorium inside, in the summer, we hardly ever see mycelium because it's, it, it's just too stinking hot, unless you have a really, really dense canopy. And even with the best program or no spray program, we will always have late season powder mildew because our temperature cools off, we're getting high humidity. I mean, humidity, humidity in July this year, several times was 2%, 2%. <laughs> but, so that, that not not sense. something that powder mildew likes. <laughs> so, so our approach is basically, if we see it, hit it hard. Sometimes, you know, I've, I've gone to the point where I sprayed Chardonnay, but not Syrah. And I'm getting away with it because of the high temperature. But there's sure. nothing I can do that says, I'm not gonna have it late in the season because it's, it's gonna be there even on blocks where you don't see it all season long, just because of declining temperature, high humidity, maybe some rainfall. But I have never seen a study that says, post harvest sprays of powdery mildew gives you any less overwintering the following year. If you have one, please send it my, my way because, and, I, and we don't see an out, we don't see a difference. Yeah. So I have very a, different, I, very different climate. Sure. Yeah, I don't know either. The question is, and how about the leaf removal? Do you do the leaf removal to increase the airflow? Which is we, very common practice. We do, kind of but we have to be very careful. Remember that, you know, that, so, in, in some years when I have, say, an, an earlier event on, on Chardonnay, for example, it is highly susceptible. What I will do, I will send my team in and remove leaves on the east side of the canopy only. 
just above the fruit zone, around the fruit zone, then yeah. apply my spray, making sure that I'll get really good bunch coverage. But we generally do not touch the west side. Our temperature here in summer continues all day. We often reach high, highest temperature at six in the afternoon. We have a low sun, lower sun angle. If you remove the leaves on the west side, you have raisins the next day. Yeah. So we have to same, be very same careful with that, with, that, with, that, with that sun. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing. We, do, we never uh, remove the leaves in the south side in California condition. Um, we do the, like the, the north side. That's a very good point. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Horst. Let's get input. Perfect. Let's see if there's any more questions, but I think that's pretty good. So, Akif, could you expand a little bit on that on that high temperature UV? What are the thresholds where body mildew is affected negatively? Well, um, uh, when the temperature goes high um, uh, after 90, 92 degrees, um, the, 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 it doesn't kill the pathogen, but the pathogen stop producing the conidia. The reproduction, it affects the reproduction of the, con the conidia. It doesn't wipe out and then kill entire the thing. If, if you have an infection before 90 degrees, you have an infection, but it doesn't produce the conidia from that point on. You just stop it right there. That's one. The second one is that the, the powdery milieu pathogen is, is, is very susceptible for the UV. It just uh, affects the, 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 again, um, conidia. Um, it's very interesting that the, during the daylight, the, 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 the pathogen is affected by the UV light. During the night, they start repairing uh, for um, they getting ready uh, for the next day kind of things. That's why uh, right now, actually, there are some, um, the UV light, the, the application uh, way of controlling the, the, the grape powdery milieu which is very difficult. Uh, they have been applying, trying to, in um, uh, northeast of uh, US. Um, th eventually, they found out that that kind of UV light application is more effective on um, uh, powdery milieu on um, strawberry than the grapevine, because in grapevine, uh, you have to have it very difficult to reach the, that UV light into the cluster. But anyway, so that's also like the, the something that has been um, uh, to try. So that's that's how it works, yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I don't see any more questions, but um, I think if we can make your email available, Keith, um, when I post this seminar online. So if any of the growers do have any uh, questions, perhaps they can send you a quick email um, if that's okay. But yes. Definitely. Please uh, contact me. And then if you want to get an idea about what we do, how we do, uh, get those information, uh, send me email. I will be happy to uh, respond to you. Uh, that's that's um, total fine. Excellent. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, everybody that attended today and thank you, Horst, for that uh, good input for the discussion as well. And uh, of course, thank you, Keith, for making the time and to uh, give this presentation to us today. Of course. Thanks for inviting me. And then uh, at the meantime, um, I'm learning um, how you guys grow grapevine in Colorado. That's, that's super spectacular. Uh, Excellent. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.